Hi everyone, this is John at Keystone Music Repair in Pottstown, Pennsylvania with a video about this one-handed saxophone. This is going to be an in-depth video going into the design of some of the mechanisms that allow this instrument to be played with only the left hand. If you want to see a shorter video, there's a link to that in the description for this video. This is a Selmer Mark VI that belongs to a player that doesn't have fine motor control in his right hand. So wherever possible, we have taken keys that would normally be played by the right hand and made them operable by the left hand. Uh, it has a full chromatic range from low D to high F, so two octaves and a minor third. Full chromatic range meaning that we're able to play every half step in, in between those that upper and lower limit. We don't have to skip any notes because we're not able to access those keys. So the only four notes that you can't play that are in the normal saxophone range are low C, low C sharp, low B, and low B flat. And uh, I'll show this more closely later, but the, the low B and B flat pad cups aren't even attached to anything. They're just suspended from the key guard to make things look kind of stock. Uh, and the low C sharp here is, is also, uh, it's just sprung shut, but it's not attached to anything. We needed a pad there to cover that tone hole so that the voicing and intonation for low D and low E flat is correct, but it, it's, it's not operable. Uh, an understandable question might be why choose to do it that way? Why choose not to have those bottom four notes playable? And as you might expect, it's a matter of economics, economics of time involved in building these mechanisms, and economics of money. Uh, it is possible to do a an instrument that has a full range all the way from low B flat to high F. And Brian Russell uh, out in Wisconsin with whom I was able to collaborate on this instrument has done that. Uh, it was it was a big project. He said it took him over a thousand hours. And after completing that, he developed some of the mechanisms that are on this instrument because he was getting approached by other players to, to do left-hand only saxophones and he wanted a way to be able to provide them with some degree of functionality uh, without breaking the bank and, and in a way that he would be able to have the time to make these modifications. So since those bottom four notes are, are going to be less frequently called upon in the literature, uh, we decided to, to balance that, uh, leaving them out with, with the keeping the cost and complexity of the mechanism down. As you add more and more notes uh, to to one hand, especially at the bottom of the instrument, each each key that you add functionality to adds an exponential amount of complexity and time and cost. Um, so if we were to just want to add low C to this mechanism, we would have to keep in mind that we need one, we only have five fingers on our left hand that could operate that key. And all five of those fingers are already committed doing other things. And we have to make sure that every key above this is closed because that's how a saxophone works in order for this key to work. So each time you add another key, you're adding complexity. You're having to do some re-engineering to, to move around some of the duties of the other fingers. So we, we've tried to balance uh, functionality with complexity and cost. Um, as I said, uh, Brian has done a full range instrument. He said it took around a thousand hours. <clears throat> this instrument took around a hundred hours uh, and, and would have been less if we hadn't done some, uh, some modifications that the player wanted after doing the first round of work. Um, why such a big difference between the two? Again, because of that, that degree of complexity uh, with each, each key you add, especially at the bottom of the instrument, you're adding so much, so much more complexity to, to the mechanism of the instrument. Um, that said, I do have an idea for how it might be possible to add a plate to the C key that would make it so that you could uh, activate it with the inner thigh of your right leg. If you're, if you're sitting with the instrument between your, your legs on a chair, which I know is, is not favored by some sax players, but uh, I had an idea for something that might, might allow us to add that key, but that, that's a story for another day. Um, so for this, for this player's needs, the, the options were 
you know, go with a, a full range instrument from low B flat to high F that would maybe be at a price that might be uncomfortable. Um, and it would be hard to find a technician that was able and willing to devote that kind of time. Uh, go with this setup that, you know, allows him to have a perfectly functional instrument. He can play in, in solo and ensemble settings. Um, or to just not do any modifications and not really have an instrument that would be functional except for a few notes in the left hand. So for, for him, this made sense to, to do these modifications. Um, <clears throat> and the cost uh, of doing all this ends up being about the same cost as uh, a new saxophone, a nice new saxophone. But that's sort of what he got. Uh, prior to doing this work, he didn't really have an instrument that he could play functionally, and now he does. So uh, I'd like to just take you through and talk about some of the mechanisms and, and how they work and sort of get into the details of it. As I mentioned, the owner of this instrument has some ability to grip and move uh, his right arm. So we have this handle <clears throat> that attaches to the plate that would have originally held the right hand thumb rest. Um, and that's just something he can grab onto. It, it, keeps his arm stable and it stabilizes the instrument at the same time. It's held on with this thumb screw so that uh, it can be removed and the instrument can be stored in the case. If that were uh, permanently affixed, it wouldn't fit in the case. <clears throat> so there's, there's three systems the, that allow us to operate right hand keys with, with the left hand on this instrument. And the, the first of those systems is the high E. So normally that would be activated with a, a little touch piece here that you hit with the crutch of your right hand. So that's been taken off. And now we've moved that up to B with the other palm keys, D, E flat, E, and F, tried to put it in a logical position. Um, the, the rocker here that lifts the key is sort of based on the position and design of the front F rocker for a Yamaha saxophone. It stops there against the post for the E flat key. If I can get it to focus, there we go. So there's the stop. So we can we can set the proper key height. <clears throat> um, this and the pinky keys were both designed uh, solely by Brian Russell and then built by the two of us together. And this was part of his effort after he was getting contacted by a lot of people about doing left-handed saxophones to be able to offer them some sort of option that he could, he would have the time to do and they would be able to afford without doing a full range instrument that was, he, he just didn't have the, the time in his schedule for and most people just weren't going to be able to, to get the money for. So uh, he developed these as, as, as having an ec economic way to, to offer that. He's done these modifications on about a half dozen instruments uh, with, with a number of other technicians uh, collaborating. And I was fortunate to be able to work with him on this one. <clears throat> uh, so the pinky keys, the other mechanism that he designed, of course, normally these would operate C sharp and B and B flat. <clears throat> um, but uh, here they've been repurposed to F sharp, F and E. And uh, you can see the way the E key works is there's these arms that come out from underneath the F sharp and F keys. And so it's just pushing both of those at the same time. The angles here uh, are, are a bit unusual. <clears throat> the, the player originally had the, the pinky table set up in the standard way. So set up just as it would have looked if it were original from the factory, as if it were still activating C sharp and B and B flat. Uh, but because now he's using these keys a lot more because the t torque uh, required to operate them is different, he was having some discomfort. Uh, so he asked us to change the angle of the E key especially so that he can kind of just lean his finger down and activate that when he's playing one of the other, these other two. Um, and we also shortened these two touch pieces and brought everything else up closer to the G key. So it's a much, much shorter reach now than it would have been uh, under the, the normal setup. Uh, so we've, 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 we've made new arms for these so that um, the, the touch pieces are attached to different rods than they would be 
in the, in the factory setup. So normally, for instance, the, this outer touch piece that would play C-sharp would be attached to this outermost rod. Uh, that's not the case now. The, this C-sharp or, or F-sharp touch piece now is attached to this second rod, uh, and our E touch piece is attached to this outermost rod. And you can see that rod uh, doesn't go the full length that it would have. It stops right here. There's a post ball brazed on here. Um, and the way these work are, there are little arms coming off of the, the keys. Oh, there we go. Come on. So there are these little arms coming off of the keys. And then there are pins that come off of the rods here that engage with those arms. And uh, we, we carefully adjusted and tested different positions for those pins so that the throw on these keys is, is correct, uh, so that everything down on this end moves roughly the same distance to get these pads from all the way open to all the way closed. And uh, we, we were able to set it up so there's no lost motion. Um, so it, it feels really snappy and positive and tight. So uh, F sharp, the F sharp touch piece here just closes the E key, uh, which also closes the F sharp key. So this is the same as playing F sharp with just the middle finger on your right hand. Uh, and then the F key, F touch piece, of course, closes the F key, which also closes F sharp. Uh, and then when we press that, E key, it's just closing everything. Uh, so then the third system are D and E flat. And this is a, the newest mechanism um, that Brian and I designed together and then I built here at my shop. These are thumb touch pieces. So we have D and then I'll do it with my left thumb. So D. And then E flat, you can either roll down or roll forward to activate the E flat key. Um, pressing the E flat by itself, there's a little uh, arm that comes underneath, so uh, the E flat key also activates the D key. And it comes down through these linkages. These are hooked up through mini balls because, uh, especially for the E flat, there's a, a long distance to cover from this post the, and this arm to the actual E flat key. Um, the key itself is actually right here, but we have to go around the instrument the other way in order to have the action the way we want it. So um, there's this, uh, this mini ball mechanism here connects to this mechanism on the C sharp hinge, which is called a bell crank. And it's called that because these are used in bell towers where you have a vertical rope hanging down that needs to pull a clapper horizontally. So it, it just, it converts vertical motion into horizontal motion. And if I, so we have, we have a mini ball pulling down here and then that pushes this mechanism across. Uh, and then, so this arm that's being pushed is attached to this funny looking clamp on the E flat key. Uh, that's uh, it's clamped on the bridge of the E flat key to open it. The reason for this clamp is that the player wanted to keep as much of the original key work intact as possible. So where possible, we were able to source new keys to, to modify and then just take the old keys off and set them aside so that someday if if someone wants to return this saxophone to factory condition, they can take off the modified keys, put on the original keys, you know, make a bunch of adjustments, replace pads and stuff, uh, and and play this instrument in in the way it was originally designed from the factory. There would be a few extra posts on it, you know, that could be left or or removed. They're not hurting anything. Um, the only the only tricky thing is is that we have this post ball that we added for the E key. Um, which would interfere now if we tried to put the C-sharp rod back on it. Would, it's, it's in the path of that. So it would interfere with the rod trying to get to this post here. Uh, so that would, that would have to be removed. But 
uh, for the most part, we were able to achieve what he wanted and, and keep the original key work intact, source new keys to modify. Uh, but we weren't able to get uh, a replacement E flat key and didn't want to spend the time to, to build a key from scratch that would have been cost prohibitive. So this clamp just allows us to attach the new mechanism to the E flat key in a way that is not permanent. There's a couple of Allen head screws in here. And if we just took out those screws, we could pull this clamp off and that, that key would be back to factory condition. A couple other things I wanted to show here. First, like I mentioned before, the low B and low B flat key cups are just cosmetic. They're suspended from the key guard there. Uh, with these screws that go through what would have been the adjustable bumpers. The C-sharp key you can see there uh, is just sprung shut and that hinge has been split um, so that we can mount the bell crank on this hinge which is just really conveniently located for what we needed to do linking the E-flat touch piece to the E-flat key up there. Uh, the other thing is to point out that because the D and E flat are both actuated by the left thumb, it's not possible to press these touch pieces and also press the octave key. So it doesn't facilitate a good way to play middle D and E flat. You can just lift those notes up uh, without using the octave key. Um, the the simple solution and the way that this player was playing this instrument uh, before we had added these two keys in order to play middle D and middle E flat was to just use the D and E flat palm keys uh, with no octave key and that gives you uh, a harmonic fingering for D and E flat that's pretty close to the the timbre and intonation of the the normal uh, D and E flat fingerings with the octave key. It's it's not exactly the same, but it's it's pretty close, and it it allows him to play those notes. So he can continue to do that. Use use the the D and E flat palm keys to play middle D and E flat. Or now that he has these touch pieces, he can play the the long fingering uh, and just lift them up, since he he won't also be able to activate the octave key at the same time. That's pretty much. Yeah, that's that's what makes this instrument work. Uh, if you have any questions, you can certainly post them in the comments below this video. You can email me, john at keystonemusicrepair.com. And thanks very much for watching.